No, that would have driven them away on side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're ready. Thank you. I want to speak this morning on Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Two simple verses, but we'll be going over two weeks because I'm wanting it in a fortnight's time so you can start planning where to go. <laughs> I can speak for a month on those two verses very e easily. They're wonderful verses, and we're going to start where John left off last Sunday in Hebrews 11. It's always good to have your message confirmed by the Holy Spirit, and I listened to a message there a week or so ago on Hebrews 11 and then John spoke about it last week. Let's pray first. Father, we just pray that you'll speak to our hearts today as we look at these two verses. May our lives be transformed more and more to be like that of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. The title is Looking Unto Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1-2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand on the throne of God. Begins with therefore, so we need to therefore look at the preceding chapter. And John was speaking about it, this great by faith chapter, as it's commonly called. And we look at Abraham, and I want to do this fairly quickly, but in chapter 11, speaking about Abraham, it says, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Remember, Abraham was taken from Ur of the Chaldees and told to go to a far country. He wasn't told where it was. But he was looking for a city, his foundations, and builder and maker is God. What was that? Couldn't be the earthly Jerusalem, because God didn't make the foundations of that. He was involved in the details of the temple, yes. Then further on in verse 13, and John quoted this and says, All these died... These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Sounds sad, isn't it? Imagine living a life by faith, this and by faith, that throughout your entire life, and it says you didn't receive the promises. That's sad. But it's not really. Just keep reading. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, Embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. By faith, Abraham. What amazing faith he had that he was assured of what God had planned and prepared for him. How could he know about a city whose builder and maker is God, the heavenly city of New Jerusalem that will come down out of heaven? I really don't know. I have no answer at all except... By faith, by faith, by faith in God. And it goes on to say, For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Back to Ur of the Chaldees. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham could look so far forward, trusting in the God whom he knew, whom he loved, and whom he served, that he could look right forward to that heavenly city. That's always amazed me ever since he'd been a young boy, the strength of his faith. But that is to be the strength of our faith. Our faith should be the same as his. Who would you pick if you had to make a list of these faithful ones in Hebrews 11? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pick Rahab. She's just a woman. Yeah. Well, that's the way the Jewish people sort of looked at it anyway, because a woman couldn't testify in court and things like that. Sorry, Carolyn, I didn't mean to look at you then. <laughs> but I wouldn't pick her. She was a prostitute, and she told a lie. No, that's not the reason I wouldn't pick it. That's true. 
But it says, by faith Rahab. She hid the spies and she lied about it. But she had an abiding faith in God. You know, my life will not be like Abraham's. If two thousands of years later you look back, I will only qualify, if anything, for one tiny little verse, I think. Something like right here. That's all she's mentioned. But the theme is and the key is they live their lives by faith. There are far greater men and women of God than me who have done far more important things. I might have stood before a pulpit for the first time when I was 14 and been behind it a lot since. But there's plenty of people who've been servants of the Lord and their faith was stronger. I wandered off in a wilderness experience like the children of Israel. Very foolish of me. By faith, that is the key. All of these witnesses in chapter 11, by faith. And that is the message this morning that we are to go out from here with. By faith and walk by faith in God. So therefore, it says, and some of them, I'm sorry, that says, some of them were stoned and some of them were sawn in two. The prophet Isaiah apparently, legend has it, or that he was sawn in two. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Of them the world was not worthy, it says. We don't know who the writer of Hebrews is for sure, it's possibly Paul. And so all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. When are we made perfect? When Christ shall return, the dead in Christ shall arise, and we, the living who remain, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And they shall be made perfect with us. You see, there's that heavenly city, there's that perfection, there's that thing that by faith Abraham looked for. And I would need at least an hour to explain that verse because it goes into end time theology and we won't do that this morning. A great cloud of witnesses. The Greek word for cloud denotes a cloudy, shapeless mass covering the heavens. Hence, metaphorically, a dense multitude or a throng of people. And how blessed are we, because we've also got another great cloud of witnesses, the writers of the New Testament, and all who are spoken of and spoke in it, they are witnesses too. But what is a witness? A witness is someone who stands in the very place and observes what happens in front of them, an eyewitness. Norma, I witnessed someone fall on a cruise ship once and it got her into all sorts of trouble because she got subpoenaed to go to a court in Wobba Walker and give testimony, stand stand on the judge and be quizzed by lawyers, and I don't think she would have enjoyed that very much. But because she was a witness of something, she had to testify to what happened. And that's the second meaning of it. She got away with it, actually. I managed to tell her I was so old and feeble, I got feeble that I needed it. And it worked. The second one is a person whose life, having been lived by faith, bears witness to what is right and wrong. It is a testimony as to what has happened beforehand and others can learn from it. I tuned out during ads on TV but there was an ad a while ago where this man was gone to heaven and that's a presumption everyone makes if you live a reasonably good life you'll go to heaven. And they put his old car outside the funeral home and the comment was made, he'll be looking down today and be so pleased to see that car there. The idea in culture today is that people are in heaven looking down, witnessing what we were doing, what we are doing. That we'd be watched by our departed loved ones. But that's not what Hebrews 12, 1 is teaching. Building on Hebrews 1, 11, the author begins drawing up some practical lessons. The witnesses are the people whom God commends for their faith in chapter 11, and there is a large crowd of them in heaven in that heavenly city and again we're not going into the detail of that the proper interpretation of 12 1 is that the men and women forming the great cloud of witnesses are witnesses to the value of living by faith their old testament stories give testimony to the blessings of choosing faith over fear since we have so many tried and true examples of proven faith so it's not that people are in heaven watching us as if our lives on earth are so interesting 
Well, they have nothing better to do, but that those who have gone before us have set a lasting example for us. The record of their lives bears witness to faith in God and truth. The parable of Lazarus in Luke 16, some have tried to use that to justify the idea of looking down from heaven on earth. But that's fundamentally flawed because that is Sheol or Hades, which is the temporary abode of the souls of the dead. Spoken of throughout scripture from Genesis 37 onwards. It's not heaven, it's not hell, but that is eternal. Anyone who is in heaven and hell will be there for all eternity, nor is it the earth, it is a temporary abode. Spoken of, though, is Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort and the place of torment. Can you remember the last person who spoke about one of the, a message from one of these cloud of witnesses here at Living Hope? Any answers? Well, John did last week about Abraham. He's one of the ones. Michael spoke about Elijah. In fact, he did a series on it. And the last one was the power of prayer. Remember, six times he sent his servant out to see if it was going to rain. And the seventh time was that tiny little cloud on the horizon. There is Elijah, if you like, still speaking today through the written word of Scripture. And it's wonderful to listen to those series. Ron has also spoken about it. I've spoken about Jeremiah and Job and so on. Their testimony and their witness and their example is still being spoken of today. Recently I watched a sermon on Hebrews 11. I missed the first two minutes. But the preacher was likening our departed loved ones to the audience in a football stadium. And they're looking down, they're cheering on, come on, go hardy, you can do it. You're nearly there. Come on, you're about to win. And he was talking about Christians looking down from heaven. But you know, I really think Christians in heaven today will be looking at the Lord Jesus. They won't be looking down. And I know my father died very young. And if he'd been in heaven looking down to me, he would have seen me wandering around, wasting my time, not serving the Lord for several years. And that would have brought sadness and sorrow and pain. And neither of those things will ever have a part in heaven. We're told that clearly in Scripture. People like to talk about looking down on loved ones, but always in a positive way. I've never yet heard anyone say, oh, my loved one departed father is looking down and how sad he was because I failed when I robbed that bank or whatever it was. It's always this, it's nice to be encouraged. And this preacher was using it and I was wanting to see chapter and verse. But I don't know of any chapter or verse to support that teaching. Now I'm not going to condemn a preach because of one thing that I see differently. It was a good message, better spoken than I'll ever speak. But who does look down from heaven at us? God himself knows everything that we are doing. He sees everything we do. He knows even our most idle thoughts. We are told that the angels observe us. In Ecclesiastes 5, 6, it says, Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. An angel is a messenger of God. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, speaking of the apostles, it says, We have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And you can see Ephesians 3, 10 as well. And the fact that angels are observing us on a daily basis should surely make us look at our own conduct as to how we are living our lives. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares. Do we really have to do this bit? I don't want really to talk about sin. But it's right in the middle of this passage of scripture and it's important. Let us lay aside every weight. Doesn't mean join Jenny Craig. It's not talking about your waistline. But speaking about everything that weighs us down as it is a hindrance in our Christian walk and pathway. Many ordinary things like sport, work, families, holidays and so forth, good and important, like so many of them are, can become a hindrance that weighs us down, preventing us from fulfilling all that the Lord will have us do in service for him. Oftentimes we are weighed down of emotional and the physical worries that tend to be a burden to us. 
They are a very real, genuine part of life and difficult to go through, and we know those who are going through these experiences at this time. And I wouldn't be flippant about it at all. But take them to the Lord in prayer and leave the burden there. Doesn't mean stop praying, but leave the burden in the hands of the one who knows all. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Don't go through life with a bag of cement on your shoulders. Be active. Lay it aside and leave it there. Easier said than done. But it's a physical thing. Pick it up. Lay it aside. Put it somewhere where it will no longer be weighing you down. And the sin that so easily ensnares us. Rob's already mentioned the answer to sin. And it's in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to keep close accounts with God. But it's always challenging to read about how it so easily ensnares and entangles us. There was a young boy who liked climbing trees and he ran up this bug and Billy a tree and climbed halfway up before he suddenly realised his mistake. <laughs> Stuck with thorns and things digging into him. He had to call to his father and his father had to remove those branches and get him out there and rescue him. And that's not exactly what sin does to a person. Those thorns dig in and get a hold of you. We all know what it is at times. Those sins do ensnare us and entangle us and take us, waste our time with things that do not profit. I'm not going to say who that silly little boy was either. <laughs> but let sin not easily ensnare us. Oftentimes we sin against another person, whether a believer or not. James 5.16, confess your faults and sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Proverbs 28.13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who ever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. James 4, 7 to 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Tell Satan to go to hell. He's going there anyway. I heard a preacher say that as a young boy. I came to the Lord as eight, and he, that was very, very radical talk back in those days. Tell Satan to go to hell. And I thought it was so good at night time, I told Satan to go to hell, and I called him every rude name I knew which wasn't very many in those days, but I thought him as a useless no hope and all the rest of it. But then I got a little bit scared and maybe Satan would be able to get me. And to my eternal, well, maybe not eternal shame, I sort of said to Satan, well, maybe I've been exaggerating it a bit and you're not quite as bad after all. Mm -hmm. How foolish. Resist the devil and he will flee. Satan goes to our adversary, goes around like a roaring eye, whom he seeking those whom he may devour. Therefore, resist steadfastly. So let us be resisting all that Satan would do. There are sins of permission, rob a bank. I'm old down so feeble I can't do anything much, so money doesn't interest me much. I've no desire to rob a bank because I know full well I'd never be able to make a quick getaway at my age. But there are other things that can affect me Murder, no. Putting needles in strawberries, how silly, terrible, lying. Things that I have sadly done. But we can confess them and be cleansed fully. Then there's sins of omission. The sin of omission is a sin that takes place because of not doing something that is right that we should do. Like not praying, not reading a Bible, not standing up for what is right, or not sharing Christ with other people. James 4, 7, 8 is often used as a key verse regarding sins of omission. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This overriding theme provides the basis for the concept of sin of omission. No church, no reading of Bible, no prayer, no helping the poor. Remember the Good Samaritan? The religious people passed by on the other side, but the owner of the pub most unlikely person picked him up, took him to the inn and fed him and bound up his wounds. 
Let us run with endurance. Time is rapidly running out. The Amplified Translation says, Let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence. Persistence, the appointed course of the race that is set before us. There is an appointed course. There is that which is set before us. John and James, or John spoke last time about how he went to Bible college but ended up in the Middle East and he didn't know it. That's the race that he was to run. I've never been called to run that exact race. That wasn't set before me. But let us all run the race with endurance. I took up jogging as a young man. I swam 100 laps in an Olympic sprint because I saw an old lady of 80 who was doing a lap for every year of her age and I was not letting no 80 year old lady beat me, I can tell you. So I got up to 100 laps non-stop. I ran a one mile race in the Churches of Christ sports day. I thought if I came home the victor, all the young girls would be immensely attracted to me. And I'm not going to tell you where I came, except that it wasn't last. But in all of these activities, endurance, perseverance, you will go through times of struggle, the first few laps of whatever you struggle. Then you get going, you're good. But then there's always periods where you seem to struggle and you can't work out why. And then you get towards the finish line, the hundred laps are coming up, I've only got ten to go. Then you almost you know, cruise them. That's like life, we'll go through these periods of struggles in the way. But let us run with endurance the race that is before us. Very quickly though, in this race there are times to, it's a marathon race, not a 50 metre sprint. But it's not a baton relay, because you'd get into trouble if you did some of these things in a baton relay. There are times to go slow. The Bible says be slow to anger. There are times to be still. Imagine being still in a baton race, you'd be howling, wouldn't you? Be still and know that I am God quiet meditation and praise. There are times to wait on the Lord doing nothing more than praying about a situation until he reveals his will. I don't mean doing nothing full stop, but about that very concern and burden that you've had. There are times to be silent and listen. Some people simply need a listening ear. They don't need to bash them of scripture after scripture after scripture. Listen intently to their concerns and problems. And then as the Holy Spirit gives you up and speak to them about their need. If they don't know the Lord, you can speak to them about Him. But listen, and listen well first. There are times of urgency where speed is essential. Reach a dying person and share the message of salvation because their eternal destiny is at stake. I was down there at Torbal once and I got the phone call my brother was in hospital and he wasn't going to last out the night. We rushed home, we rushed to that hospital. One final time I shared the gospel with him. I've told the story in full before. He was so far gone he couldn't even talk, but he nodded vigorously when I asked him if he would accept Christ as his saviour. And he did it in front of the witnesses, the family, most of whom still don't believe. There were times to flee. Speaking with the love of money, he said, you are a man of God. Flee from these things and pursue righteousness. There are times to be always prepared. Bit of a contradiction, that isn't it? Always be ready to give an account of the hope that is in you. Always be ready to share the message of salvation. Always be ready to share why you believe what the Word of God says. And there are times to pause and read and learn. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 17 speaks about there is a time for everything under the sun. And Ecclesiastes does tend to be a bit like fatalism, man under the sun and the futility of it all. But that's your homework for the day. I suffer from delusions that I'm a teacher. You can read Ecclesians, Ecclesiastes rather, 3, 1 to 17. And you see that God calls for repentance and obedience in that passage. So it's not just fatalism. Read it and study it as you go through this week. There is a time for everything under the sun. What would the Lord have you to do this week as you run with endurance the race that is set before you? Looking unto Jesus. And we'll look at that next week. Not next week, next fortnight. It's a wonderful encouragement because it's very hard to sin. 
when you are looking unto Jesus. With eyes fixed on the Saviour, go out into this sinful world around us. Yes, we can still sin. Sometimes Satan can even sneak in wrong thoughts, even around the Lord's table. And it horrifies me that he can do that. But let us go out. Let us be encouraged because the good bit is still to come. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We thank you that he is with us every single step of the way. That we can look unto him for guidance. That we can look unto him for help in time of trouble. We thank you for our eternal salvation. We thank you for the grace, the enabling grace that gets us through day by day. We just praise you and thank you this morning for you are a truly wonderful God. And we give you thanks in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen.